a green usla, ton kamorisha, a grievner and leacon, a harlan shod loon mult, kade vianohin. Tugan and kamora, desh doing, or mass, agus or mwakus, a quernul de winter and a hota, a vi partux a leacon. Gohoraha, dove shoed a mariuk, a gortiuk, agus a dulling, a real leacon, loon mult. On the 100th anniversary of the Clan Mult ambush, we commemorate those who died, those who were injured, and those whose lives were impacted by the events on this very site 100 years ago. Imlina, ni federling chocolate de varna pandema, conan kamora, sha a kalura. Akfos, tugana lukna, a honing kun keen, la lingna blina sha, fwen of doing. Lukan ernos, the lu forty ucht, ain't ucht, agus kahu pubble. Vina lukana sha, leraha, is sailed to Navarre, a taller kamora and sha. Kega will meet a vado on a kela, Glock meet on desha, Leve, Lena Clowna, Conbarta, August Geneverta, Navarre, a ahant. Although COVID 19 prevents us from joining together in person to share this commemoration, we can take strength in the values that have come to the fore throughout the last 12 months of the pandemic. Values such as solidarity and unity, and a reawakening of the values of community. These values were evident in the lives of the men we commemorate and we take this opportunity to join with our families, albeit from afar, in recognising their deeds and remembering their actions. Quernan an cáid seo i gwyf na dwi'n gyrhyd mwynter na hoita agus gynnyar na siad i bwrti ond ys gyfeif ydys marag tol i tîr a tôr seir agus nafs bloch i niw. Smwyn ymid gohoraha o'r o siad o'r irhyr corgi a hryd o'r o'r son i rhyd cogan ys eirse. Fi rôl tawag da cao sna hymag ti a harla ced fyn o hyn, agus tug ymid ash eintas dyn eish bres a fi ag mwynter na hoita an seo i gari la ras. As the War of Independence continues to be commemorated throughout the country at both local and national level, our commemoration recognises events which occurred in our own locality. We reach out to the memory of the many men and women who played their part in the events of 100 years ago, and we recognise the local experience of the War of Independence as it unfolded here in Gary Lawrence and in the surrounding East Cork countryside. Ni more doing a new, smwynev er is partig an liacon. Fer an yachig, i mwn trwda er san na seirse, agus na fer cena, nor hon i gawalia. Ni more doing freshen, smwynev er na dini a vig fullant, the vor an liacon. Cwynamid er na aspartig, agus er am winter, a vi fri vron. To fully commemorate the events of 100 years ago, we have to recall not only the participants and victims of the Clan Mult ambush, but also to recognise all of those who suffered in its midst and in its wake. The men that sought and were fighting for independence, but their fate meant that some of them would never come home. We remember each victim and honour the grief carried by their families down through the decades. We hold the memory of their loved ones close, giving them life again through sharing their story and through respectful remembrance. They are our families, our friends, and our people. Queen Amish, Orhu, Illig. We remember them all. Akarda, on behalf of the Clan Malt Ambush Commemoration Committee, I welcome you to our virtual presentation of the scenery of Clan Malt Ambush, which took place here 100 years ago on this afternoon. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, our plans for this day had to be seriously altered. To the families and close friends of those involved here on that fateful day, we regret your absence. We are planning to hold a commemoration at a future date when it is safe for the community to be here with us. We as a community began our journey in 2017 when as a group of local people, we wanted to commemorate this day as a community day. At Clanmalt on the 20th of February 1921, 12 members of the Flying Column lost their lives. Three more members would die before the truce in July. They paid the ultimate price for what we have today. The nine who survived would carry the scares and memories of Clanmalt with them for the rest of their lives. One of the survivors of Clan Malt wrote in his witness statement, and I quote, of the original column, 
I am the sole survivor. I pray for them constantly and have shed many a tear over my memories. Always when I hear the soldier's song, and particularly when the anthem is played by the Artean Brass Band to the thousands assembled in Croke Park, Dublin. I listen to the thousands singing, but I shed silent tears and think of my dear former comrades, pray that God in his mercy has seen fit to assemble them with him in his heavenly home. For they are deserving of eternal happiness. I know them all intimately and fail to recall anything but the noblest instincts in good, clean living men. Men who were inspired by their love of Ireland and nobly died in her cause. May their souls rest in peace." Unquote. On this journey, we started out as a group of eight. Later, we co-opted a few more to our committee. What you, what you see here today is not ours only to take pride in. We did the thinking, late night meeting, plans and plans, discussions of the usual meeting rooms, opinions. We got treated to milk without less tea or coffee at one meeting by a member who recommended it as a coolant. When the map for our journey to this day was ready, we turned to the local community and you are not found wanting. Show us the way and we will travel the road with you. That seemed to be the matter. The community of spirit of Clanmult and Dungorny is something we should cherish very dearly and pass it on in a healthy state to the next generation. Support for what we have achieved here today came in many forums. We would like to acknowledge the contribution of Cork County Council, Conor Nelligan Heritage Officer, for their wisdom, experience and financial support to us. To, to all the companies, businesses, individuals who gave us a friendly ear, your support, be it financial, materials, tradesmen, machinery, calendar selling, all is very much appreciated. To Mike Oosterhausen, Mick and Edward Cheedy, the sculptor from Middleton, it's been a pleasure working with you. You gave us memorials in Clanmult that these volunteers so richly deserved. I would again like to thank the contribution of all my committee to this project. What we see here today really is the work of community spirit at its finest. Finally, to my personal backroom staff, Geraldine, Sinead, Tim and Maraid, thank you for your patience, understanding and commitment in getting me to where we are today. Thank you. During the War of Independence, captured volunteers were interned in Ballykenler Barracks, County Down. Ballykenler was a mass internment camp and could house over 2,000 prisoners. Inmates endured a harsh regime. Making wooden crosses in memory of fallen comrades became a hobby of the prisoners. A cross bearing the name of those who died at Clonmult and the prisoners who were later executed was made by Tom McMillan from Kinsale during his internment in Ballykenler camp in July 1921. 24 replica crosses have been made in memory of all who were present here in Gary Lawrence Clanmult on the 20th of February 1921. These 24 crosses are in situ in the beautifully constructed display here by the monument. The original cross, made by Tom McMain Lawn, in honour of the victims of Clanmult, will be placed by the newly created replica of the ambush site by Sinead O'Sullivan, daughter of the commemoration ambush chairman, Christy O'Sullivan. Er yeslov de greva nanamka. February in 1921 These Cork's noble heroes were ambushed in Clonmore 
For the fighting of our country's cause To free her they did go Betrayed by a cruel informer In their graves there lying low Oh, the bravest boys in Ireland and that house they did command. The Desmond brothers there did stand true rebels to the last. And many another mother's son with their hearts full of grief and woe. To think that they should be betrayed and their young lives then laid low. <laughs> Hagerty was one brave lad, so was a heron too. Like all these cark martyrs, they were brave and firm and true. Our heroes, Paddy Sullivan and more, as you now know, to cark barracks they were taken. They did invade in search of Irish rebel bands throughout many the hill and vale. Surrounded were those boys at last when the rifle fire began, and Desmond said, Have Courage, lads, we have them nearly done. <clears throat> From the top of roof and window, the lads went on to fight. But the tans they set the roof on fire left no escape. But still they kept on fighting while down they fell one by one. Then the sad news left old Middleton that the column boys were done. God rest these brave young heroes in heaven, may they be blessed. And the flag of freedom flying o'er in the churchyard where they rest. By this sacrifice from our noble Oh, it is plainly to be seen. Sure, they send and they'd fight and even die. This is a brief account of the events that led to the Battle of Clanmult on the Sunday, the 20th of February, 1921, the battle itself and the aftermath. The members of the flank column that were present here at Clanmult 
on Sunday the 20th of February 1921 were among the most active volunteers within the 4th Battalion, 1st Cork Brigade. Most of them were involved in some of the not notable successes against Crown forces during 1920, including the attack, the capture and destruction of Kaitul RIC barracks, the, cap the capture of Klein and Castle Master RIC barracks, and the very successful ambush against a British Army bicycle patrol between Middleton and Carrie Tool in June of 1920. However, the RIC were picking up information as to who these individuals were and their houses were being raided and the vast majority of them had to go on the run. In other words, they could not stay at home any longer. And because so many of these active volunteers had gone on the run, it was decided in, at the end of September 1920 to form a full-time flying column from the 4th Battalion and the column was formed in Nakraha under the command of Commandant Diarmuid O'Hurley. During 1920, then the remainder of 1920, the column operated around East Cork attempting to make contact with British forces without success. On the night of the 11th and 12th of December, the column went into Bertie Walsh's house in Klein, which was a dangerous move because Bertie Walsh was on the run himself and it was more than likely that the house was under surveillance, which it was, and because the column had not posted sentries, the first they knew on the following morning that they were in trouble was when the British Army were knocking on the front door to try and they were battering on the front door to try and come in. And the only reason they escaped on this occasion was because they made a combined aggressive breakout which got them through and out of Klein. You can see similarities now with what will happen later at Clanmult. On the 29th of December then, in the only action initiated by the column, the members of the column attacked a giant RIC black and tan foot patrol in Middleton and in that ambush an RIC constable Mullen from Yall and two black and tans Ernest Ray and Arthur Top died of their wounds. Now this is a very important engagement because this raised their profile within the Crown Forces and it's fair to say that after that ambush in Middleton the Crown Force in Middleton and Cork were determined to locate and destroy the column. The column arrived here then at Clanmult on the 6th of January 1921 and the new model here very clearly depicts the scene here. So you had a dwelling house, it appears to be a single story but in effect the loft was used for accommodation. It had a thatched roof and it had a fatal flaw and potential death trap for the column because there was only one door into the front of the house and that one door was the only way in or out of this house. There was no door at the back and should, as happened, the British Army or Crown Forces come in from the front of the house then automatically by having that door covered anybody in the house was trapped and unfortunately even though the column remained here for six weeks the column commander combinatorily did, did nothing about that flaw all he had to do was to get his men to knock a hole in the back wall as an emergency exit which some of them did during the battle but at that stage it was too late and one of the reasons that the column remained here for so long was it seems it was the collecting point for levies on farmers in, in East Cork to keep the, the, the IRA in funds for fighting this war. I mentioned that they, even though the column were here for six weeks, the Crown Force were actively looking for them and they were making progress and they were using overt and covert uh, methods, patrols, informers, uh, questioning of prisoners, and they were making, making progress. 
three or four days then before the battle on the 20th of February, on the Tuesday or Wednesday beforehand, the column was tasked with a mission by Brigade Headquarters, which was to attack a train carrying troops from Cove to Cork. And that ambush was to take place at Cove Junction and on the Tuesday, the 22nd of February. Because the column commander was tasked with that then, he had, the, 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 he had two tasks to do from that. One is he had to relocate the column from here to Dunneen, which is north of Carrytool, so it was near the ambush position. And the second job he had to do was he had to carry out a reconnaissance of Cove Junction so he could plan the ambush there. And both of those, the move out of here and the reconnaissance was timed for the Sunday. On the Saturday evening then, in a dangerous move, five or six of the column, they decided that they wanted to go to confession and instead of going to the local church, which is very close, or safer, still bring a, a priest to the site here, they went to Dungourney, which was a dangerous move. And definitely that's when the informer spotted them. And we know from the, 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 the if you like, the mirror, the mirroring of what the British Army did on the Sunday afternoon replicates what the members of the column did on Sunday, that definitely that's when they were spotted. Now, the column members did take some basic precautions on the way back, insofar as instead of coming here on the normal route into the site, they took the Dungourney Castle Lines Road, and they went beyond the site up to beside what we now know as Carey's Cottage, and they turned in off the road at Carey's Cottage. And that then is what led the informer to believe that's where the column were located. On the Sunday morning then, two young lads, John Harty and Edmund Terry, left Harty's house near Klein to cycle to the, the site here, to the column, to bring cigarettes, funds and clothing for the column. On their way then, they met two of their friends, Robert Walsh and William Gard, and the four of them arrived in Clanmull village where Edmund Terry visited his grandmother. Shortly after that then, Dick Hagerty, who was away from the column for the weekend, arrived in the village, met the four young lads, and all five arrived here at the house shortly as it transpired before the British Army attacked. Sunday mid-morning then, the column commander decided to leave here by car to carry out the reconnaissance at Cove Junction. Now, this is another place then, so first of all, they were here for six weeks, which was far too long. The second thing was the fact that so many members of the column went to confession, and this was the third one that caused problems. The column commander, instead of handing over temporary control of the column to his second in command, which is the normal practice, he took, the sec he took his second in command with him. He took Captain Paddy Whelan with him, who was the third in command. And instead of handing over to the next senior officer, he dropped the further down. So Captain Jack O'Connell, who was way down the list of seniority, was left in temporary command of the column. So by taking so many officers on the reconnaissance, the column commander weakened the column. When the column commander left here then on the Sunday mid-morning, the, his orders to Captain Jack O'Connell were to break camp and leave here for Dunneen after last light on the Sunday evening. Around midday then on the Sunday, the informer arrived in Victoria Barracks Cork and told the British Army that he had seen members of a column near Clanmult on the evening before. And the British Army acted immediately and they sent a two-vehicle mobile patrol totalling 27 officers, NCOs and men under the command of Lieutenant Tuck to investigate. The British Army mobile patrol arrived at Rathorgan Crossroads around 3 o'clock and they parked up the two Crosleys there. They set up their patrol harbour there 
and Lieutenant Tuck broke down the patrol. Nine soldiers were left to guard the patrol harbour, the vehicles, and to detain any uh, civilians that would approach the area. And because he detained two local civilians, Michael Hennessy and John Crowley, we were able then to get information from the Irish side and the English side as to what happened up there. The remainder then, 18, he broke into two more patrols. Lieutenant Hook took a patrol of eight and Lieutenant Court took a patrol of ten and they advanced up to do a cordon search of Carey's cottage because after all that's where the informer thought the column was and of course after searching the building they realised there was nobody there. Under normal circumstances the army would have said we've, we've carried out our mission, we're operating in dangerous areas, we'll get out of here and return to barracks but no. Lieutenant Tuck was a very experienced officer, he said no we're going to continue and he opened his map and he spotted this particular building here on his map and now he moved, uh, they moved out again. The two patrols, Coast Patrol, Hooks Patrol, moved out. And their primary concern would have been to avoid sentries that they took for granted would be out there. But in the final nail on the coffin of the column, the two sentries had abandoned their posts and were in the house at the very worst time. The first the indication that there was trouble was when Sonny O'Leary, one of the officers inside the house, was looking out the window and he saw soldiers passing the front of the house, out here in front of what is now the front of this building. And that was caused patrol and by pure bad luck for the column, they approached the, the house, as you look at it here, from the front. So straight away the house, even though it wasn't surrounded, it was as good as because that front door was covered. The soldiers then manoeuvred around to the left of the house and they came across two members of the column, Michael Desmond and John Joe Joyce, that were down to the left of the buildings filling water bottles. And very quickly, in a, in a sharp engagement, the two volunteers were mortally wounded. Captain Jack O'Connell in the house quickly and correctly concluded that the only chance they had was a breakout. Four men agreed to go with him. Jack O'Connell fixed the bayonet on his rifle and charged out the door. And he made for the grove of trees which is left of the front door and in doing so, in a firefight with some of the officers, he wounded CSM Corney. He got out, got, got away. Unfortunately, the next four delayed that couple of seconds too long and gave the British Army soldiers an opportunity to get ready. So as they came out, they were quickly shot. Michael Hallahan was shot at the door of the front door of the house. Dick Hagerty, who had only rejoined the column very shortly before, was mortally wounded and he died in the front of the building. The third man out was Captain James Ahern from Cove and he managed to run in a south westerly direction unfortunately towards Rathorgan crossroads and we know from the evidence that he was shot by one of the sentries up at Rathorgan crossroads. The last man out was Captain Sonny O'Leary. He ran out, managed to get into the cow shed. He realised quickly that his chances of getting through the cordon were remote so he ran back into the house under a hail of bullets, none of which actually hit him. The breakout was over. At this stage, five, of the mem five members of the column are dead. Lieutenant Hook then realised that he didn't have enough soldiers to overwhelm the house. So he sent two soldiers from here to Rat Organ to get one of the drivers to take one of the Crosleys to Middleton RIC barracks to see if he could get reinforcements. And unfortunately for the column, by pure chance, there were two truckloads of auxiliaries had just called in to Middleton RIC barracks. They were on mobile patrol around East Cork and just happened to call there. And they arrived here at the site 
around half past five and the two soldiers that had been sent up by Lieutenant Hook brought petrol and grenades with them. And Lieutenant Hook decided he was going to get this battle sorted fairly rapidly. So he came around the back of the house, stood up in the ditch and threw the open can of petrol up and the thatch, threw a couple of grenades up afterwards and now the thatch was on fire. Those trapped inside had now a choice of either surrender or born to death. So eventually, after about 15 or 20 minutes, during which they were guaranteed their safety by one of the British Army officers, the first bunch of, of volunteers came out of the house. So 12 of them came out. At this stage, there were 15 left inside in the house. And 12 of them came out, including the four young lads that had cycled here and they were told, and at this stage the auxiliaries were out in the yard in front, and the auxiliaries directed them to stand in front of the cow shed. One of them, the young lad, John Harty, received a, a blow to the face from one of the auxiliaries, but he recovered and he was in there. Almost immediately, the auxiliary police opened up on them, and seven of the prisoners were shot dead and that brought then the total number killed here from the column to 12. The four young lads were not killed. Only one member of the column actually survived that and that was Captain Paddy Higgins and it was a miracle he survived because one of the auxiliaries put a revolver to his mouth and pulled the trigger and the bullet only partially detonated and went through his upper lip and lodged in between his teeth. And the intervention of one of the British Army officers prevented the auxiliaries from killing the remainder of the prisoners. The last three, Sonny O'Leary, Paddy Higgins and Morris Moore were delayed in exiting and that delay saved their, saved their lives. Now the, the, the men, the members of the column that were killed against the cow shed by the auxiliary police were Donald Dennehy, Christopher O'Sullivan, Jeremiah Hearn and his first cousin Liam, David Desmond, whose brother Michael had been killed earlier at the well, Joseph Morrissey and James Glavin. The British Army then collected their prisoners, all eight of them, collected any weapons and ammunition that they found and quickly vacated the battle site because at this stage now, uh, we'll say nightfall was starting to come in and it was time to, to leave. So the prisoners were searched, taken to the trucks, to Middleton RIC barracks and from there to Victoria barracks. The 12 bodies were left here overnight and shortly after the, the site was located by the Crown Forces, local civilians came in and collected bodies. The three officers that had left earlier on reconnaissance, they met Jack O'Connell in Nokraha and later that night the four officers returned here but at that stage there was nothing they could do. The 12 bodies were removed from here on the Monday morning by the British Army and taken to Victoria Barracks. On Wednesday a military court of inquiry was held in Victoria Barracks the bodies were removed on Wednesday night to Middleton and Cove. Their funeral took place on Thursday. Nine of the men were buried in Middleton and two in Cove. The twelfth man, Dick Hagerty, was buried in Ballamacoda on the Friday. Seven of the eight prisoners then were tried by military court in March and the four young lads, the four cyclists, were sentenced to penal servitude for life and the three adults, O'Sullivan, Moore and O'Leary were sentenced to death. O'Leary's sentence was commuted to penal servitude for life and Morris Moore and Patrick O'Sullivan were executed into the military detention barracks in Cork on the 28th of April. And that meant that 14 of the column were killed as a result of Clan Mult. Paddy Higgins then, the man that had been wounded against the wall of the, the cow shed after surrendering, he was eventually tried 
and convicted and sentenced to death in June. And he appealed and he continued to appeal and his life was saved by the truth. Dermot Hurley then, the column commander, he was killed north of Middleton on the 28th of May. The men of the column were indeed very brave men and were well aware of the risks they faced. They faced overwhelming odds and knew if they were captured that they still faced the possibility of execution. An amazing statistic is that of the members of the column here on the 20th of February 1921, 75% of them were dead by the end of May. It is so important for us to continue to remember all of these men, their bravery, the sacrifices they made, and let's work together to ensure that their names shall never be forgotten. Thank you very much. A hundred years on from any event, one will find few, if any, who lived through it, and even a dwindling number of people who knew anyone who took part. And so it is with the Battle of Clanmult. It is customary in all faiths and traditions to remember those who have passed, and especially so when they gave their lives in the service of others. In that spirit, we remember those who gave up their lives in the cause of Irish freedom at Clanmult on Sunday the 20th of February 1921. In the springtime of the year and indeed in the springtime of their manhood. Many accounts have been written about the battle in the past hundred years. Anyone who wants to understand why those young men gave their lives should take the time to read some of those accounts. They range from compelling witness statements by surviving members of the 4th Battalion to meticulously researched publications by academic and military historians. All attest to the bravery of those men in a desperate situation. However, as with other conflicts in history, I have found that when one has absorbed the facts, what the mind retains are the stories of those who lived through the times and the events. So let me recall such stories as retold by Tom O'Neill in his account of the aftermath of the battle. The first is by Captain Paddy Whelan, who had returned to the scene of the battle around midnight with three of his fellow officers. He describes the scene as he began to identify the 12 bodies of his comrades. I undertook the heartbreaking task of uncovering their faces and identifying them, calling out each consecutively. This sad task took me some time, but between sobs of anguish, I managed it. There were two distinct pauses as I went along the row as I had great difficulty in naming Liam Ahern, Joseph Ahern's brother, and Jerry Ahern, first cousin of Joseph, I will not even attempt to describe the mental anguish of Dermot O'Hurley. All four of us, Dermot, Joseph, Jacko and myself, sobbed with a terrible grief and a sense of loss at the fate that had befallen our beloved comrades. Some four or five of whom had bullet holes in the face just below their eyes where they had been shot by the tens whilst prisoners. There was nothing we could do but cover their faces again and take our sad departure to Liam Laura. The second story evokes the sacrifice and grief as experienced by the families. Information on the battle reached the families of the column members on Sunday night and Monday morning. The mother of the two Desmond brothers, Michael and David, 
was very ill in, at her home in Middleton. At about 6 p.m., her daughters, who were in an, ad an adjacent room, heard her speaking to someone. They went to her bedroom to find that she was alone. They asked her who was she speaking to. She told them that she'd been speaking with David and Michael, but everything was all right. They were with God. She died on Sunday, the 11th of July, the day the truce was signed. The third story gives an indication of the depth of feeling evoked by the sacrifice at Clanmult. It is a measure of the people's support for the cause that the volunteers espoused. James Glavin's father, thanking Cove Urban District Council for their vote of sympathy, wrote, It is a source of consolation to us to realise that our son gave his life in company with his gallant and brave companions, many of whom were natives of Cove for our dear country. So for us today, who are charged with passing on the baton of remembrance, it's fitting that we should do so in ways that will ensure future generations would appreciate the sacrifices made at Clanmult on that fateful Sunday evening of the 20th of February 1921. Current restrictions due to the pandemic prevent a fitting commemoration at the battle site, as has been the case every year. However, the remarkable work of the Clonmult Ambush Centenary Commemoration Committee has ensured that in the print and audiovisual media and on the ground, fitting memorials preserve the story. And in that, I must, should say, great credit is due to the O'Sullivan family who have maintained the memorial on their property through these many years. Thanks to these efforts and the abiding memory of the people of East Cork, the sacrifice by the men of the Flying Column a hundred years ago will not be forgotten. Their names are enshrined for future generation. As a fitting epitaph, let us reflect on, the, on their heroism as expressed in the final verse of Clanmult's Lonely Vale. So now, kind friends, I will conclude, and I think it only fair, that old and young as you pass along, for them kindly breathe a prayer. And when the flag of freedom flies high o'er Grand New Ale, we'll think with pride on the men who died in Clanmult's Lonely Vale. Thank you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Falter wrote Goler, you are welcome this afternoon for our time of prayer here at the ambush site. I'll begin with a blessing of the monuments, then we'll have some prayers, and we finish with a decade of the rosary for those who died here. Heavenly Father, protector of your people, look on us with your love as we gather here in your name. As we gather here in this historic site in Clanmult, we do so with gratitude for the sacrifices that have been made here, the ultimate sacrifice of one's life. We remember all who died here 100 years ago. May this historic site always be a place of reflection for us as we recall the past, live the present, and hope for what the future will bring us. And I ask you to bless it, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
My brothers and sisters, we believe that all the ties of friendship and affection which knit us as one throughout our lives do not unravel with death. Confident that God always remembers the good we have done and forgives our sins, let us now pray, asking God to gather to himself all our loved ones and all the faithful departed. Almighty God, through the death and through the death of your Son on the cross, you destroyed our death. Through his rest in the tomb, you hallowed the graves of all who believe in you. And through his rising again, you restored us to eternal life. God of the living and the dead, accept our prayers for those who have died in Christ and are buried with him in the hope of rising again. Since they were true to your name on earth, let them praise you forever in the joys of heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The reading is from St. John's Gospel. Jesus sa said to his disciples, Anyone who loves his life loses it. Anyone who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If a man serves me, he must follow me. Wherever I am, my servant will be there too. If anyone serves me, my Father will honour him. God the Almighty Father raised his Son Jesus Christ from the dead. With confidence we ask him to save all his people, living and dead. For those who died here in Clanmult and those who died sub subsequently, that they may have the reward of their goodness. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those who have fa fallen asleep in the hope of rising again, that they may see God face to face. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For those whose faith was known to you alone, that they may have light, happiness and peace. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For all who mourn for the loss of their loved ones, that they may find comfort in their sadness, certainty in their doubt, and courage in their loneliness. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. For ourselves here today, that we may be reunited one day with all whom we love, when every tear will be wiped away. Lord, hear us. Lord, graciously hear us. God, our shelter and our strength, you listen in love to the cry of your people. Hear the prayers we offer for our departed brothers and sisters. Cleanse them of their sins and grant them a place in heaven. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. L let us pray. Lord God, whose days are without end and whose mercies be, mercies be uncounting, keep us mindful that life is short and the hour of death unknown. Let your Spirit guide our days on earth in the ways of holiness and justice that we may serve you in union with the whole Church, sure in faith, strong in hope, and perfect in love. And when our earthly journey is ended, lead us rejoicing into your kingdom, where you live and reign forever and ever. May perpetual light shine upon them, and may they rest in peace. May their souls and the souls of all the faithful departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen.